Okay, so macroeconomics for development. Um, I'm partly talking today about this because WIDA is going to be starting a, a program of work around macro. So it would be good when we get to the Q&A to get some ideas about you know, where we should go in this, uh, in this area of work. And it's, it's good to remind ourselves, and already I'll, the, the, all, the previous speakers have, have done some of this, about how different in some ways 85 is to 2015 and how much it is the same. Uh, we know the Africa story in the mid-80s of recession and stabilization. I, I first went to Africa in 1980 when I was in Tanzania during a massive foreign exchange crisis trying to work as an economist in government. And those were really, really hard times. And then we had the big uh, start of transition, obviously, the China uh, emergence. The big gorilla, if we can call them that at the time, was, of course, the U.S. Fed. Today, the big gorilla is the U.S. Fed and China. So something has changed in the, in the global economy. Um, to a degree, the questions that we discussed around the impact of the bigger uh, gorillas in the, in the global economy and their impact on macro policy are the same today, that many fragile and small economies are very vulnerable to the movements in, uh, in global aggregates. And today we're talking about, as we did in the, uh, the mid-80s, about the commodity roller coaster. So some questions are the same. Um, some have changed uh, quite radically. Um, the big themes of the th last 30 years, uh, I always recommend people to read that wonderful paper by Carlos Diaz Salajandro. There was actually a wider conference on it in the mid-80s. Uh, he summed it up. It's the best title for a paper I've ever seen. Goodbye financial uh, repression. Hello financial um, crash. Uh, this has been a constant theme over of 30 years, not only in the uh, developing world, of course, but also uh, in the richer world. Uh, and it's been much harder to move from repressed financial systems to liberalized um, financial systems. Uh, and indeed, that's still a, a big challenge for uh, middle-income countries now as they go forward in developing uh, effective financial uh, regulation. Uh, something we've learned over 30 years is that financial problems always become fiscal problems. Um, in pretty big ways. And of course, for a small, um, open, developing country, the opportunity cost of a, of a financial crisis become a fiscal crisis is very large in terms of lost social spending. Uh, when you get the macro uh, framework wrong and you end up with uh, a private financial crisis which you then have to take on to the public books through the issue of public debt or increased uh, public spending, that's really an opportunity cost for all that um, poverty reduction spending and social spending that you need. And that's something that we've learned constantly over the last 30 years. We know that commodities are a roller coaster. I'll return to that in a while. We do know whether we have less reliance on official aid and more private finance. That raises to a degree different uh, macroeconomic management problems. Um, to a degree, whether the different types of flow are more stable. Unfortunately, there's still a lot of instability um, around um, flows of official aid, which leads to the problems in the macroeconomic management of aid. Uh, we at WIDA have a, um, a special issue of world development, which is just out this year, on uh, what we know about the macroeconomic management of, of aid. Um, and then finally, I think the, the, one of the big ones, it's surprising how many governments and companies really do think that creditors are their friends. You know, when you cheerfully meet a merchant banker who wants to help you to issue that sovereign bond, that he's doing you a big favor. And, you know, whether it's a small country or it's a bigger country like Greece, creditors are not your friends. And you learn that at a pretty catastrophic moment when you've run out of policy options and you're being um, forced into a position of debt service, continued debt service at the cost of public spending or indeed debt default and exit from the sovereign market. So, looking ahead a little bit, the left-hand column um, we've already gone through, uh, HIPIC debt relief was, of course, a big one around the early 90s. We, we had a big, wider conference here uh, around about 2000 about HIPIC debt relief. Uh, one of the issues of the 80s and 90s was restoring fiscal management and the fiscal stance, as Steve mentioned. Uh, I do urge you to take a look at the Stiglitz 98 annual wider lecture, which is on the website, because there Joe was really having a go at uh, IMF policy around Ethiopia. Uh, at that point in the late 90s, many countries were still very much aid dependent for their uh, public finances. Uh, we moved on somewhat from that. 
Uh, the issues around Dutch disease and the management of Dutch disease, still a big issue for us. Um, looking forward, uh, what we might see over the next 30 years, and I'm looking forward to coming back to the uh, annual uh, uh, conferences we'll have celebrating my row 35, 40, 45, and then I'll turn up at a ghost uh, at the, uh, the 50th, probably. Um, really, the bigger task of how you're going to build uh, domestic revenues into uh, your macroeconomic framework uh, in a more uh, profound sense. We're going to have a session on tax issues this afternoon, but really, you know, the optimism around aid has pretty much disappeared. If you want to be reliant on aid, and unfortunately still many countries are, uh, you might turn out to be very disappointed. And really building stability into your macroeconomic framework when you are so reliant unexpectedly on domestic revenues, including obviously domestic debt issued in domestic bond markets, as well as your sovereign debt. The management of, of, of debt, uh, this has been discussed by the, the previous uh, two speakers. I think the, the issue of infrastructure bonds, which Ethiopia uh, and other countries have done, Kenya has done quite successfully, is a very interesting area. And in some ways, if you, get the, if you get the rate of return right on the infrastructure and the rate of return exceeds the debt that you've issued, then you're, you're good. You're good for growth and you're good for a more expansionary macro policy down the line. But, you know, the tasks around actually um, managing and appraising uh, infrastructure to get the right kinds of infrastructure projects that do really deliver you the growth to repay the debt are not as easy as uh, sometimes people pretend. Uh, big issues around uh, financial deepening and inclusion, obviously. Uh, notably, Rajan in India uh, has gone out on a big campaign around getting the, the financial system to be more inclusive. As it call people are not just reliant on microfinance. Going forward, I think one issue that we haven't really explored much in developing countries is the, is the macro impact of dem demographic change. We're going to see very big rises in populations uh, over the next uh, 30 years. Uh, the golden period, the demographic dividend, as it's called, will have savings and investment uh, implications. And then finally, the really big one, which is the macroeconomic impact of climate shocks and what they will mean. Uh, potential loss of revenue, potential loss of uh, uh, key export sectors, how, that, how, that, how we can build resilience into the macroeconomic framework on that. Okay, well, let me in my last uh, few minutes just switch gear and think about a little bit about what's happening at the moment. Um, give you some thoughts. Well, that's happening at the moment. Uh, crude oil has gone woo. Don't need to tell you that. And commodity prices have generally gone down with it. Um, I'm not going to talk here about, uh, about uh, food commodities, though they're important. There's another wider project led by Per Pinstrup Anderson on that. But we are seeing what, for many people, was quite an unexpected shock. Um, we could have a lot of discussion about the causes of that shock, but we have a very interesting geopolitical combination where OPEC is trying to drive out, sorry, Saudi Arabia is trying to drive out US shale producers. It's finding that as a much tougher job. Uh, the oil market, oil demand is, is still growing. Uh, China is still importing oil, but there is just a, a massive oversupply, and Iran is adding to that. There is an overall lift to the global economy. Uh, the IMF uh, has given out some recent estimates. But a lot of the oil importers, actually, uh, some of them can't take much advantage of that because they have structural problems, structural rigidities on their export side, infrastructure, energy. Uh, so some of the net benefit of the oil price drop to the um, oil importers has not been as big as we'd have expected. And, of course, some of the countries... Uh, are suffering themselves from the sell-off in metals, uh, Zambia on copper, uh, South Africa we've discussed. So they're suffering a simultaneous uh, terms of trade shock. So things are improving on the, on the import side through a lower oil price, but deteriorating on the commodity side. Um, we've seen that some have ample fiscal buffers. The example of uh, Botswana always comes up, but many do not. Uh, Angola, Nigeria, Steve has already mentioned, are finding themselves in a very difficult position. The average fiscal loss is about 4% of GDP. There's a lot more to some of the smaller um, exporters. What do you do in that situation? Well, many of them are running down their foreign exchange reserves or depreciating their currencies. Uh, they're running the classic risk of maintaining the peg 
uh, at the danger or cost of uh, rapidly losing reserves. Uh, if you look at, say, the Venezuela case, uh, Venezuela is uh, probably on the edge of default. Um, one of the most difficult cases, a rapid movement into fiscal deficit. A uh, bit difficult to read this diagram, but the story here is a big drop in reserves, uh, including Nigeria. Some countries like Indonesia are in a much better position because they've diversified exports, but generally it's a difficult period. Some countries have maintained pegs, but now are abandoning those pegs. Others are conducting large depreciations. Um, they're being helped along the way that some of the hedge funds, for example, um, are shorting commodity currencies. So if you want to short copper, one way you can short copper is um, short the Chilean currency, and likewise probably other emerging currencies. Malaysia's currency is right down as well. And some of the African countries as well, as we've seen, are undergoing quite large depreciations. Ben Unadula was going to be at this conference, uh, but he's uh, busy dealing with some of this. Okay, so for the last five minutes or so, let's talk debt. And there's only really one thing to say about debt, which is uh, James Carville said it. Um, he was Clinton's uh, advisor in the 90s. He said, he said when, he, when he comes to reincarnation, um, Carville said, I want to come back as the bond market <laughs> because you get to just, you know, get to intimidate everybody. You know, finance ministers live in fear of the bond market. Um, to a degree, in low-income countries, middle-income countries, it's quite a good thing that they start to live in fear of the bond market because it's a sort of, you know, countervailing check on policy and it's something that, you know, obviously goes with becoming a richer and more developed um, country. But the bond market is not necessarily your friend. And as Steve mentioned, uh, Ghana is now back in the hands of the IMF. Uh, our respondents from Ghana might want to say something a little bit more about what they see as the situation going forward. The Fed tightening is the big question. Uh, fortunately, we had the Fed timed last night, just before this session, and um, the Fed chairman came out with a statement saying that uh, the Fed is actually holding after a long expectation it would begin rising, partly because of emerging market um, concerns. If we knew the answer to when the Fed would start tightening, then you know, all of us in this room would be very rich people. We can't predict. Stress in the bond markets has been relatively limited so far to oil companies, which are in deep trouble, some of the smaller ones. Uh, Venezuela, which I've mentioned before. Uh, there's more of an outflow uh, in terms of um, stock markets, uh, equities uh, exacerbated by the China uh, boom and then bust earlier this year. Uh, to a degree, emerging market bonds have priced in um, a lot of the uh, Fed uh, eventual rise. But there's a lot of uh, corporate debt um, sitting there, uh, particularly uh, in dollars, uh, and a lot of it sitting in Asia, and quite a lot of it sitting in China. And so if you want to rerun the 98 Asian uh, financial crisis story, you might want to run it, um, uh, look at the uh, level of corporate debt in dollars, uh, particularly in Asia, but also now in Africa to a degree. But the Fed tightening, it could be quite modest. Uh, the slowdown in China and the repreciation of the Chinese currency is to a degree exporting deflation into the US now, constraining the Fed's move. This is where, in some ways, you know, if you 30 years ago you'd said that China would have affected US monetary policy, people would just thought you were crazy and taking you out of the room. Um, so we have, in some many ways, just changed in the geo uh, geopolitics of economic policy. And Europe, of course, is weak. So the Fed tightening could be quite modest. And that's a graph of EM bond spreads. You can see, actually, that you know, Venezuela is the red one. They're in serious um, uh, trouble. The oil price is the thing going down. But even Argentina, actually, is not um, seeing too much um, chaos yet, but we shall see. Headwinds, I'll start to finish up now. We still have weak institutions. Greece demonstrated that we still do not have effective sovereign debt bankruptcy, um, despite the push by many economists, ranging from ideological opposites like Anne Kruger to Joe Stiglitz, pressing for uh, proper debt workout mechanisms for sovereign bankruptcy. We still have too much reliance on self-insurance by maintaining high foreign exchange reserves, and we still have asymmetric adjustments in the global um, system. 
So I'd like to end by saying there's a lot of big questions uh, that we need to answer in macroeconomic policy. We have moved forward in 30 years. And I think this is where I'm going to say one last thing, which is going to congratulate the way in which we've been able to work in Africa, and particularly the role of ARC in improving the quality of the macroeconomic conversation and debate and effectiveness in policy. And if there's been one really big change for Africa, I think that's been one of the most welcome changes. So thank you, Mr. Chairman.